Welcome to the Geniuses of Copywriting Podcast, a peek into the minds and strategies of the world's greatest copywriters, marketers, and persuasion experts. And now, here's your host, Brian Cassangina. Hi guys, welcome back to the Geniuses of Copywriting Podcast. It's my absolute pleasure and privilege to welcome the one and only David Deutsch here to the, to the podcast. He's one of the legends, all-time legends. If you study copywriting at all, you will know this man's name. He's got his start on Madison Avenue back in the day at Ogilvy and Mather. Uh, you know, if you, if you know those names, you know that that's, that's a, a steeped in direct response history. Then he got, went from Madison Avenue more into a direct response uh, copywriting environment. He's worked with companies like, like Agora, Rodale, and others like that. He's working with uh, plenty of different companies and plenty of different copywriters working on their copy and making it to convert higher. So uh, when, when, when you think of top copywriters, um, you know, it wouldn't be the geniuses of copywriting podcast without this man here. So I really appreciate, appreciate you coming on to the call today, David. Thank, thank you very much for joining us. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank Thanks you for, for coming on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was just a, a couple of basics that, that I know about you, but I'd love to hear more about to what you're doing and, and where you've come from and uh, yeah, how you got to where you are today, because it's a rich and interesting story. Well, I kind of uh, fell into where I got today to some extent. Um, I started working at Ogilvy and Mather um, and was in, the, uh, I was in the word processing department and uh, kind of went, you know, gee, I'd like to try my hand at writing this stuff. Yeah. So I got some experience doing that, worked my way up and became a copywriter at other, you know, ad agencies. And uh, one day I discovered uh, Jay Abraham. And I was like, wow, this is like, you know, advertising can be accountable and, and, <laughs> and advertising can sell stuff directly. This is, this is so exciting. And, you know, Ogilvy kind of prepared me for that a little bit because Ogilvy had a, I mean, he was Madison Avenue mm. TV commercial kind of guy, but he had a direct response side of him. He loved direct mail. He, he used it. And so when I discovered the Abraham, I was like, I want to do that. I want to work with companies that, that sell stuff directly. And I, I, I kind of wanted to be a junior Jay Abraham and wound up getting more into the direct response copywriting. And, um, and then I, uh, I worked with Jim Rutz, um, who gave me some great training in, uh, in direct response copywriting. Um, and then I started doing stuff on my own for clients like Boardroom and, you know, mm. Rodale and, uh, Agora. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm, I'm still doing today, except now, uh, in addition to doing writing, I also work with a lot of companies to help improve their writing capabilities, uh, work with their in-house writers. Sometimes I work with their freelance writers to take the copy to the next level. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. something I'm really interested in as well, because I really believe strongly in the, the power of mentoring and having mentors like you. So um, whoever's on the receiving end of that must be uh, um, a very lucky person. Yeah, so a little bruised probably <laughs> someone, someone, there are those that might say but you know that's the whole the the place that really interests me right is not so much teaching people this technique or that technique like yeah there are interesting techniques you could use you know here's the five ways to open a you know to open a story five ways to do this you know sell benefits don't sell features mm. You know, this little trick, that little trick, these structures, these templates. But a lot of it, so much of it has to do with the mindset when you're writing. You know, mm. and if you ever talk to someone like, you know, Gary Halbert when he was alive, right? Gary Halbert talked the same way he wrote, like he could sell you something mm. in person. And mm. that was the way he sold it on paper. Yeah, and I think yeah. so many people, when they sit down to write, they get into this writing mode, like, oh, headline, I, they, you know, I have to do this type of headline, you know, this is a killer thing, and it's going to be great and pile on the benefits. And they, they don't think about what they would do if they were just sitting across the table from mm. someone 
someone they cared about even, trying to convince them to take this action, to buy this product. They, they wouldn't be so hypey. They wouldn't be so saying things that make people roll their eyes. You know, yeah, they would, yeah. It reminds me of, a, of, a, of an exercise, and I'm, I would pay dearly to go to a seminar like this, where, where Gary Halbert, at a seminar, had all the attendees write, to, write uh, a, a letter, write two letters to their mom. Like one, right. um, one like I love you, mum, and one, one I hate you, mum, and it was right. designed to get that to to get that emotion out and and really write to a person that, that you care, rather than just using the mechanics of of direct response, which work, but you know they're just a framework. Yeah, I I was at that seminar too. It was a very powerful. Wow. Well, you know, Gary makes you put a stamp on it. You yeah. know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know that's true. It's like. People have this amazing ability to persuade inside them, right? They've been persuading ever since they were a little baby, mm. crying to persuade people to take care of them and pay attention to them. And they, you know, and every day we persuade people to go to this movie, to, 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 to marry us, to go out with us, to, um, to, to complete this job for us. You know, in a million ways we persuade people. And then we sit down to write and we kind of get into writing mode. Like we're back in yeah. school. You know, it's like, oh, I got to do this. I got to, oh, don't forget to do a lot of benefits. Got to make the benefits as big as possible. And we don't think about all the ways we build trust, all the ways we become credible and likable to people in copy and how, in, how much more important that is. You know, we buy from people we like and trust. We don't, buy from the salesman that makes us the biggest promise yeah true um and that's that's what i've that's what i found when i've done some direct sales jobs uh you know door to door or over the phone or whatever uh, this mm -hmm. is back in the day you know i learned early on and this is probably 10 years ago that uh, that it was all about the mindset which is what you mentioned before if i just pulled out the the phrases and sayings that the uh, the sales organization taught you and just tried to try to kind of slam dunk every everyone uh, into the sale um, mm -hmm. that didn't work but when I I, I think when I when I uh, really spoke to that person uh, as, as one human to another that that was something along the lines of the of the mindset that you're talking about yeah yeah and it's amazing what happens when you do that you know and that's what really great copy does and it's a scary thing to do because you're kind of mm -hmm. like you know giving up all these things that you've relied on for all these years yeah you know, the manipulation of words in certain ways the making it sound like this sort of thing is supposed to sound and you're kind of like going out on a limb taking a page to build trust or to initially build trust or, or some kind of credibility yeah. in a headline rather than oh here's all the money you're going to make or mm. you know we're really going to cure arthritis with this cure you yeah. know thing yeah. or whatever it is and a lot of my working with, with people is it takes a while to break people of that habit. You know, it's like, is this it? No, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. this is why that's not it. This is why, yeah. you know, try it again, try it again, try it again. And then, you know, you break through. And, you know, that can be a painful process if, you're, if, you're, um, if your ego is attached to mm. your right. Mm. So what's what's the kind of way that you um, when you're working with a writer you help separate their ego from uh, you know just as you, as you just said get their ego out out of the way so they can they can really communicate with the other person. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. You know, I think the people that are the best, you know, become the best writers are able to do that inherently. Mm -hmm. No, they're not, you know, they're not um, identified with what they write. They don't see what they write as being them. I mean, it hurts, right? You, you want the person reading your copy to like it. You know, you want David Deutsch to like this copy that you, mm -hmm. you just wrote. But, you know, it's kind of like going to the gym. The, the pain is what builds the muscle. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, that yeah, hurts. Yeah. So good. I'm building muscle, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just kind of talking to them about that and saying, listen, I'm, you know, I'm going to be hard on this. And, you know, I'm not always going to remember to say nice things about it. You know, 
you're you're working with me because you're a good writer, right? Like we know you're already like at a certain level. You can write, you can do the stuff you've been doing. But to go to the next level, it's kind of like you've got to, you know, die to what you were before and be reborn. Mm. You know, not to get into too much into religious, you know, iconography. But it's kind of like that. You have yeah. to yeah. be reborn again. And you, you have to let go of that stuff that you've relied on and that you've gotten damn good at, you know? Mm. The people that I work with, they're pretty good at, you know, piling on benefits and, yeah. you know, doing all that stuff and using the formulas and, and all that. Uh, but to get to the next level, they've got to kind of let go of that to some extent. Mm. Yeah, you're right. It's it's uh, um, it takes a brave writer because uh, you know uh, uh, you want to you're looking at creating a marketing piece without all the elements that you've uh, um, been trained that have to be there. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's going to be a flop. So, do you find that? Um, uh, I imagine you find that that people are somewhat resistant to this. Are they? Uh, um, can they be coached over the line, or do they take a lot of work, or or do they sometimes surprise you in in uh, in the way they come along, or is is it really hard work for a mentor like you to 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 get people to really embrace this mindset? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say it's hard work. I think it's just like you said. It takes a certain degree of courage. It takes a certain mm. degree of, you know, like getting knocked down and coming back for more, you know, it's yeah, like, no, yeah, it's not it yet. you know, here's why it's not where it mm. needs to be yet. You know, John Carlton tells of going through 16 drafts of the first thing he wrote for Gary Halbert. Yeah. And yeah. the 16th draft was, you know, worse than the other 15 drafts, but the 17th draft was great. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't That's have to be a, you know, a painful process or, or, you know, mm. Um, you know, you, you feel like you're, you know, a lot of people that you just feel like you're learning because of that, you know, mm. if it was easy, it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be what needs to be done. It wouldn't be working. You know, yeah. it's going to, you're going to feel that breaking through. And as you say, it does take courage to kind of face the ways in which your writing isn't there yet. You know what I mean? It's funny. People come to someone and say, I want to be a better writer. I want to get to that next level, A level or, you know, whatever. And the way to do that is you have to see why your writing isn't there yet. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's a most people, you know, to some extent, people don't want to see why their writing isn't there yet. Mm. They just want to know what they have to like pile on top of it to make it be there. Yeah, yeah. They, they want to hear... Um, uh, you know, because this is what uh, a part of me wants to hear, you know, uh, your writing's already perfect, but to go to the next level, you need to do this and do this. Right, and right, this. Right, right. <laughs> but, uh, um, but that's, that's like, it's never the case. So, um, uh, you know, the other thing too, I think is it's kind of like with music, um, where you can tell when something's out of tune, you know, to some extent, what we're doing is training the writer to tell when his writing is is out of tune, mm. you know, so that they hear it, they see it, mm. because that's what writing is really. I don't know that I my first draft is inherently better than anyone else's first draft, but when I read my first draft, I could see what it needs. I can mm. hear, oh, that's not. They're not going to yeah, believe yeah. That. that's yeah. too dissonant. I need to do this, and and so I know how to revise it. And that's, I think, what a large part of training someone in copywriting is, is just improving their ear. So they, they hear what the copy needs. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of copywriters seem to be musicians as well. So maybe, maybe it, the two are connected. <laughs> yeah, I've always found that interesting. Yeah. 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 And the two probably are connected, you know, in a certain way. You're putting words together. You're putting notes together. You're, you're composing. Yeah, yeah. Because I interviewed David Garfinkel, and he's got his guitar in the background. And, and I know that uh, the guys always have the jam sessions at uh, Kevin Rogers' uh, Copy Chief Live right. event, which uh, right. um, I still be meaning to go to one of them. So, um, so yeah, it's really, it's really interesting how the... Um, the same thing that makes a uh, uh, 
uh, a good copywriter um, seems to be linked with musicianship as well, which uh, makes me glad I, I, was, I was playing guitar for 10 years before I ever uh, started writing copy. <laughs> so maybe yeah. I've got a chance. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of tells you something, whether you're a musician or not, that just like music is about listening, writing is about listening. Mm. It's about listening to your own words that you've said and hearing them as a prospect would hear them hmm. and being able to kind of have those same reactions. Like, I don't believe this. I don't, you know, so what? I don't care. It's, this is not, you know, or, you know, a rolling of the eyes. Like, yeah, right. That's, yeah, you yeah. know, that's going to happen. That's true. That's, I don't believe that. So you, that's, then you then respond to that, hmm. Hmm. Uh, you know, and, I mean, a heavy-handed way to do that, for instance, is say, I know that sounds unbelievable, but let me show you yeah. why that, you know. Yeah, why yeah. That. Yeah, because I'm wondering exactly how you, how you do that. I mean, do you just, like, uh, go through each statement on a piece of copy and, and, uh, and, and think to yourself, read that statement and say, so what, or, or I don't believe that, that claim, or, or what have you? Well, yeah, that's, that's certainly a good exercise to do. Um, is to just, and that's again, the listening. It's kind of like, mm. when you read it, something's gotta go off in you. Like, you gotta feel like, oh, I want some proof for that, right? I need more proof. Mm. I need more, uh, I, I don't trust you yet enough to take yeah. this thing. You know, I don't trust you yet enough to buy from you. Mm. Uh, but you know, you could do worse than to go through your copy and see every fact you state or claim you make and say, do I need something to back that up? Mm. It doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, it just could be a little, you know, source of where you got it from or back up from the media. Yeah. That some media also said this. It could be, it could be a lot of times proof is just, I mean, we can get a, we could do a whole session on proof. Mm. Yeah, we start with that. <laughs> You know, a lot of times proof is just common sense. It's just saying to someone, you know, you make a statement and then you say, well, you could see that in your own life as being true because of X, Y, and Z. Or it's just like when this happens. And they go, oh, yeah. that is just like that. So, yeah. so that must be true because it's just like that. I know that that's true. So that must be true. Yeah, that's a good way of doing it. You know, comparing it to, to something that they already know is true. Right. Mm. Right. Yes. It's a really but you got to do that work for them. Like so many people, they, one thing I think people don't understand, it's not that readers are lazy, even though they may well be, um, but they're not going to put the effort into figuring things out, right? So you've, at a, far more than most people think, you've got to connect the dots for people. I call it connecting the dots, yeah. right? You can't just say something and expect them to go, oh, I see how that mm. proves that thing. Or I see how that could be a benefit for what he's been talking about. You have to really kind of stall things out, you know. And this is why that is a benefit for what I've been talking about. Because mm. it links in this way. Or, you know, you give proof and you say. So you could see that this is, you know, yeah. again, that kind of heavy handed. But you, you really want to be explaining you really want to be connecting dots for people you can't leave them to to do that yeah yeah that's uh, something that uh, um a lot of copywriters myself included have trouble with over the years you know you want to be clever and sound intelligent um but you leave too many dots to connect uh, in your marketing piece and it's going to flop right because the reader won't connect them and so they'll have this vague feeling of disconnection and mm. lack of but you yeah. think you put everything in there that needs to go in there mm. yeah and um uh of course everyone thinks their market is different their, their market is more sophisticated their market is more intelligent right. um uh how do, how do you tackle this with uh, with people who really are sophisticated um because it's no different there i think you know, um, no. you've, got do, you've got to do the same thing there and connect the dots. But, but it may, is it in a different way or did you just, you just uh, use the same techniques? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. Even people who are sophisticated haven't got time to like, mm. even someone that's capable of reading a paper on nuclear physics, you know, 
when they sit down to read your copy or don't sit down, they're probably standing yeah. up. Um, you know, they don't want to put that same amount of effort into reading your copy. They want mm -hmm. it to be simple and go in easy and, 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 and not be a burden, you know, to mm -hmm. them. In addition, they've done studies that have shown that, that the simpler something is, the more believable it is. Mm. Interesting. Because if you make it too complex, then it sounds like you're trying to explain it uh, too much and there's some sort of ulterior motive, maybe. Yes, you, you over-explain. It makes people suspicious yeah. if you're too sophisticated. If they don't understand it, you know, or if it's difficult to understand, you know. It's kind of like, you know, if you think about those things that we that people believe, right? Like a stitch in time saves nine, mm. right? It's believable because it's simple. Yeah. And it's also believable because it rhymes. But, you know, even if it rhymed and it was complex, it wouldn't be as believable as that mm. little zingy, oh, that must be true because it's so short and simple and, you know, comes out so yeah. nicely. Yeah. Like, even that's, though yeah. As you probably know, there's also, for every saying like that, there's the opposite saying, you know. Mm. Um, you, I, and I, I, I'm not facile enough to, to think of what they are, but you know, the stitch inside says, oh, there's another saying that's like, penny saves is a penny or something that contradicts that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, these so, old sayings, yeah. Um, but they, these old sayings stick around because they're just simple, you know, and they're, they're memorable. You don't have to memorize 15 or 20 words. It's just like right. uh, five words. I've always kind of felt like you've got to give people the ability to make your sales pitch for you after they've read the thing. It's almost mm -hmm. like you have to kind of imagine that this guy or this woman is going to read your copy and have to explain why they just paid all this money to their spouse. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And would they be able to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Or would they just be, I don't know, it's something, it'll help me make money, I'm not sure what, you know. Yeah. Or, or would they really yeah. be able to, to, to have a very logical, you know, simple argument as to why it's unique and why it's worth that money? And if you yeah. kind of aim for that, that's a great way to, to write copy. And it's also a great test. You know, you give it to someone to read, you say, okay, tell me why I should buy this. Mm. You know, if they give your argument very logically and coherently and compellingly you go, Oh yeah, I did my job. But if they just sort of say, I don't know, it, it just sort of sounded good and it could make me a lot of money or yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure how something to do with, you know, reselling, you know, postage stamps or something. Yeah. Then, you know, if you don't have that, your copy isn't that powerful. Mm. And a lot of times, of course, people, the beauty of that too is, a lot of times people do have to explain a purchase to their spouse. And if they don't, they kind of have to explain it to themselves. Mm. You know, if you have kind of emotionally got them to want to buy, they still have to have a, a rational, as you know, argument. And so yeah. if Justify. you make it, they're being able to do that, they'll be able to explain to themselves why they're paying all this money for this thing you're selling them. Yeah. Is this something that you largely tackle in the big idea or the hook? Um, so I know some of the big ideas that, that I've seen from Agora over the years are, are um, really not, don't just explain the offer to the reader, but, but they allow that uh, the purchaser to explain the offer to someone else. Like, uh, um, like one was uh, um, uh, PABX is in the phone lines going across America and it was a new, a new railroad, uh, across America, mm -hmm. and that, that was the uh, um, the metaphor that they used uh, to explain this communication system, mm -hmm. um, and that gives uh, the purchaser a, um, a, a way to uh, compare it to a known variable, uh, you know, to their husband or wife. Right, right. That's that's just what we've been talking about. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. It's they can then say to them, "Sweetie, this is this is like a rail. This is like the railroad was." Yeah. Yeah. yeah in the old days, connecting all these things together, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, you know, so, the, the, so the communication system connects everyone together. That's why you bought it, yeah. Right, right. It's a, oh, and so that's just like the railroads were a huge investment opportunity. You know, this mm. is a investment opportunity for us, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that gives that uh, um, 
that argument to the purchaser who may not have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, like a, a creative enough to come up with something like that by themselves. You've got to give that to him. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So how do you come up? How do you come up with something like that? Uh, um, this is something that uh, um, uh, I've really focused on learning how to do in the last couple of years uh, since I've really been studying Agora and, and their, their big ideas. How do you come up with that hook or that big idea um, uh, that really helps explain everything in such a simple way? I mean, uh, it's not it's not something you can sort of explain in right. minutes, but right. But, uh, well, you, you know, that? Th there's a couple of things. One is, um, and I've got like a whole course on this uh, in, in terms of creativity, which is um, a kind of a systematic way of of going about generating ideas, right? So you look at this. Thing, this PBX system, you know, yeah. and you go, okay, what do, what do I think of when I think of when I look at this? Like, what associations come to mind? Well, it looks like spaghetti. Look at all these yeah. networks connecting each other. It looks like you know, I don't know, like a maze, like a puzzle. Um, uh, it kind of looks like a map with all these things going across. I don't know. It almost looks like a railroad map yeah. with all things kind of you know going like that. Oh, railroad, that's kind of interesting because the railroad was originally high tech. Yeah, yeah, back in the day, yeah. And it went back in the day and was a huge investment opportunity. So I know what I'll do. I'll take this and I'll relate it to, you know, the railroad. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll say it's like a new railroad going across America. Yeah. You just have to kind of keep, it's, you just have to keep asking your mind questions, you know, mm. because if you just sort of sit there and, try to think what's a big idea that I should do, your mind will just wander and not necessarily do anything. But yeah. if you really keep asking, like, you know, um, and that's, that's part of what's in my, my creativity thing is mm. it's like a series of questions you can ask. Like, what's the opposite of this? Like, well, the opposite of connecting is disconnecting. You know, how could I have a big idea with that? You know, and mm. well, you can do something like, you know, the disconnection of America. America has become disconnected and this is going to connect it again. So yeah. you're starting with the disconnection. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a stupid idea, but you get the idea of how you yeah, can- Yeah, I've got the principle for sure, yeah. Do the opposite of things. Like, you know, um, I always loved that great Arthur Johnson uh, headline where everyone was, everyone was saying, you know, everyone knew you shouldn't drink coffee and you shouldn't smoke cigarettes and you shouldn't eat bad food and you should drink a lot of water. And he did the opposite. You know, he came out, he, he did the opposite for a, for a promotion uh, for Dr. Douglas because Dr. Douglas was very skeptical about all that stuff. So, you know, Dr. Douglas said, you know, you, you, you don't have to drink all that water and it's all right to drink coffee yeah. and you don't have to exercise yourself to death. And it was very, it was great because that's, <laughs> What people want to hear of course yeah <laughs> and it's different from what everyone else is saying too yeah and it's so different from what everyone else is saying so doing you know kind of again that kind of question what's the opposite of this what if i divided it up into into different pieces mm. that had an idea what if i added something else you know a lot of time well of course the railroad thing is kind of an adding something else mm. but yeah um, there's different ways you can do it a lot of times adding something else is like current events. You tie it into, you know, you tie it into something that's going on right now, or you tie it into a celebrity or something, you know, um, you know, um, you know, the, uh, who's a, a famous celebrity these days, you know, well, you know, the Donald Trump secret to whatever. Yeah. And yeah. Somehow, you know, it connects to Donald Trump because it's, mm. I don't know, because it's, you know, phone lines and Donald Trump's always on the phone. I don't know. Yeah. You know, whatever it is. You know, <laughs> you can I know, know Agora's these Trump in something or other there. Right, right. Promise, that's yeah. our that's yeah. our thing. If we can yeah. find a way to bring in yeah. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> something something about the wall, maybe. <laughs> Building celebrities the wall. are another thing. You know, the mm. celebrity secret. People always want to know, you know, what is it celebrities are doing? Mm. And sometimes you just like think. 
let's find a way to tie it into this, right? Like, don't be too quick to reject things like the celebrity secret. Like, go out and see how it, like maybe celebrities were the first people to get these new PBX phone lines yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Maybe there's yeah. some way that, you know, that we can tie celebrities in general, you know, mm. into, because they're using it or they're affected by it yeah, or something. Yeah. And you mentioned the right current celebrity and, and then everybody knows him. It's the instant connect. And I've got a um, slightly ulterior motive for this. I've just wor started working on a, on a big package for, for a client and, and it's, I'm at the big idea stage where I want to come up with that one hook that, uh, that I can base the whole thing around. So um, yeah, you've given me some great ammo to do that. Yeah. You know, that said, it's kind of funny. Um, that said about the importance of asking questions and active kind of an active thinking at the same time, what also works is a period where you don't think about anything. You know, you just sit quietly, almost kind of meditatively and just let whatever comes into your head, come into your head. And mm. which is of course why people have ideas in the shower because that's yeah. Yeah. inherently how people are when they're showering. You know? <laughs> They're in a sort of meditative state. The water is coming down like a waterfall. Mm. And all of a sudden, this thing comes to them. So at the same time, you do that question and you do that active stuff. It's good sometimes to also just sit quietly and um, see what, what comes to you. Yeah, it could be a waterfall of PBXs across America or something like that. Right, right. Because <laughs> uh, like the best ideas I've had kind of have popped into my head, mm. you know, and when I've just been quiet or, you know, yeah. it's never when you sit down and think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to think of a big idea. I'm going to think of an amazing idea. That's not how it works. You know, I've never done that successfully ever. I don't think it's always, uh, like you say, when a random, like I'm in the shower or, or thinking about something else, especially if, you know, you're not, uh, um, focused, you know, watching TV or something, uh, you, you've got that, uh, meditative state. Um, that's what it tends to happen. Yeah, but you have to have the preparation. You have to have, mm. you know, activated your mind, your subconscious to be thinking about it. Which is yeah. things like, oh, what does this remind me of? It reminds me of trains. Oh, this, you know, yeah. oh, look like spaghetti. How can celebrities, you know, be part of it? And mm. then you kind of go off and just kind of sit quietly. And hopefully into your head pops, you know, the new railroad across America. Like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you gotta have done that let that groundwork beforehand. Mm, mm. Yeah. The other way that uh, um that I heard from uh, uh uh the Agora guys when I was at a uh, uh event in Orlando was um uh they actually um write down on on a on a Google sheet one one big idea each day. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter if it's good or bad, if it's useful or not useful. Um, they just get into the habit of writing one down. So they end up with it like a database of, yeah. of big ideas that they can draw from. And it also gets them in the habit of, uh, of uh, uh, thinking of these big ideas, even if they don't have a project in mind for that. Big right. Idea. Well, of course, you know, the brain works by habit. You know, mm. if every day you sit down and come up with a big idea or, or 10 big ideas, like James Altucher says, um, and they don't have to be big ideas necessarily, but if you just come up with 10 ideas, your brain will eventually catch on. Oh, every day I'm supposed to come up with 10 big ideas. I, I yeah. should be working on this, you know, in, in the office. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, it, it just kind of prepares you and it gets your brain in the habit. Mm. It's, it's a great thing to do. Yeah. It's like writing every day. You know, if you write every day, your brain kind of gets, you know, I go, it's time to write. I'm going to get into that mode now. Yeah, yeah. That's how I got into um, this night writing mo mode because it's like, uh, it's about midnight here, um, mm -hmm. which uh, for a lot of people would be too late to write, but I'm always working at this time anyway. And that's because I've just gotten into the habit of writing at this time. You know, for, um, uh, I used to watch TV, but, uh, but now I don't uh, um, watch a great deal of, of TV at all. And, um, I live in Bangkok and they, and they, they do have some cable channels, but uh, most of it's in the local language. So uh, it's not a great deal on TV, um, but I'm not a big TV watcher anymore anyway. So um, 
uh, that's kind of how I got into the habit of sitting down at the computer and writing uh, during mm-hmm. the evening and sometimes into the night. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, it's a great thing to have regular habits. I don't always do that, of course, but, you know, when yeah, I do, yeah. I'm, oh, this is great. Like my, my, you know, it's predictable and my brain likes that predictability. Mm, mm. In, uh, in his book on writing, uh, Stephen King said that he writes uh, every day but Christmas. Uh, and mm-hmm. even then after he's... Uh, uh, had his turkey, everyone's in a food coma, he sneaks down to the study and does and whacks out a bit of writing. So uh, he literally writes every day. That's how he writes the big fat books, you know, two or three yeah. or four a year. He's very That's productive. what Dan Kennedy does too. Yeah. He writes every day, you know, the does same thing. Does he still write that much? What, what's that? Does he still write that much? I think so, yeah. Yeah. A lot of what he does is, of course, content for newsletters and, mm. you know, and, and things like that. So he's always got something, you know, yeah yeah i mean it was um probably 15 years ago when i bought the the mother of all offers which is like his like everything that he that he sells and Mm -hmm. i got that shipped over from the states and and uh, that was three huge boxes and and since then he's probably produced more more courses and content and seminars than than the 10 other normal human beings will ever produce in their entire life Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a massive work, body of work, but he's another yeah. really productive one. Yeah, it shows you the power of that predictability. You know, he mm-hmm. writes every morning. He's got times allotted, you know, to write. Yeah. And I think that um, uh, being on on social media as much as I am, I see a lot of people you know, posting uh, posting their pictures from the, the beach in Bali and and uh, walking right. through the forest and. Uh, and also claiming to be, you know, um, these seven figure online entrepreneurs. And, and, um, <clears throat> uh, of course the, the sitting on the beach is probably only um, a few minutes of their day. The rest of their day is working on, on the, on their actual business. If they are, um, a high earner, mm-hmm. but it uh, paints a picture to other people that, uh, that all they do is sit on the beach all day and the money comes in automatically and, and the, the copy gets written and the business gets run. Um, you know, from their phones on the beach, which is which is not necessarily the truth. So, that's right. I think that's um, a trap that people fall into, thinking that uh, you know um, they can work uh, fifteen minutes a day and then and then and then make all this money. Um, when it just doesn't happen that way. No, no, it doesn't. But you know, it's a nice it's a nice fantasy anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's what business opportunity pitches have been uh, based on for so many years. Um, work work an hour a day and get to get paid uh, um, all this money and uh, otherwise who who would buy a you know a two thousand um, uh, dollar information product you know, that said you know work eighty hour days and work eighty hour weeks and and uh, and struggle for for years and then finally start earning some money that that sales pitch doesn 't really uh, have the same ring to it as as work 15 minutes a day for, for $10,000 a month. Right. Right. Mm. Although, you know, it's funny. There's always, we we're talking before about the opposite. There's, there's always a place for the opposite. You know, it's like, um, for so long exercise stuff was sold as the same way. Oh, it's so easy. It's only, you know, 10 minutes a day yeah. or, you know, yeah. you're not going to break a sweat. And then P90X came out and it was like, you got to work hard. You, yeah. It's going to are you ready for this? You know, yeah, yeah. and it's like, lo and behold, the opposite also works, mm. you know, mm. because people do like to be challenged and they do like part of them knows what the reality is, you know, no pain, no gain, you know, yeah. and, and maybe it's partly that maybe it's also partly that's a whole other section of the market that hadn't been marketed to was the people that mm. are okay with it being hard. So yeah, can... yeah, and P90X had a good, a big idea as well. But um, the th- same thing happens um, in entrepreneurship. You know, uh, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is is the uh, most famous mm. guy, always talking about hustling or uh, working yeah, your ass yeah, off, yeah. and uh, uh, being so busy that you're always working. And and uh, Gene Simmons was another guy who said that. But uh, but now, um, see. Um, uh, being busy on social media, you're so busy, you've got hardly time for anything else, is, 
is, is seen as, as being high status. So you show yourself traveling and, and always working. And uh, if you do down at the beach, you've got the laptop and you're typing out a sales letter, that kind of level of, uh, of activity on your business, um, we're not just sitting back and relaxing. That is now seen as, uh, as a, a high status person that, that you should follow on social media. So, um, right. yeah, the opposite is true there too. So, um, uh, uh, I won't keep you much longer because I know you're very busy. I just wanted to ask you one question, which I'm very intrigued about. Um, and, um, uh, uh, I wanted to get at this straight from the source. Who's the uh, weirdest or, or quirkiest copywriter that, that you know, um, living or deceased, that, that you know of in the industry? No, oh, that's an interesting question. It, it, you know, the competition on that is very tough. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just pick one. Pick, pick one and go with it. My, myself included. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, you know, the quirkiest really was Jim Rutz you know, back in the day, who was, uh, I mentioned before, was the, uh, the writer that I, that I worked with and just learned so much amazing stuff from. But, you know, he was almost like uh, Sheldon on Big Bang Theory, you know, just yeah. in terms of um, social awkwardness. Awkwardness, yeah. Kinds of things, you know, and... Uh, which is, of course, funny because, you know, on, on, on the page, you know, in his writing, he was so interesting and so, so drew, you know, drew you in, you know, to mm. it. Um, and, you know, and, you know, under the social awkwardness, he was a, a very, you know, warm and giving and, you know, tremendously yeah, yeah. generous person. He's helped me in so many ways. Um, but, um, you always kind of like, you know, like with Sheldon, you always kind of had to keep an eye on him as to, you know, who may a waitress that he was liable to offend, you know, because he's <laughs> like, no, you couldn't just say things like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a fun guy, though. He was very fun. And God, he was so intelligent and so yeah. interesting. Mm. Uh, and, and his writing is so unlike anyone else's you know it's just interesting writing you know a lot of writers aren't great writers they're they're great salesmen they're great they're great at knowing what psychological buttons to push um but you wouldn't like look at their writing irrespective of the selling and the psychological appropriateness of it and say oh that's great writing that's great putting words together that's yeah, so yeah. clever that's so interesting how he did that and unexpected. But with Jim, you would, you would just go, wow, that's just interesting. No matter what. Yeah. He yeah. could take any subject and make it interesting. Mm. Um, he's got a couple of books. One of them is um, mega, mega something. And um, that have to do with his uh, open church. The other one is the open church. And I, one of them or both of them begin with a little history of, um christianity and kind of how it evolved and he just makes it into the most interesting couple of paragraphs of the history yeah. of christianity that you'd ever want to read mm. so he does it in such an interesting way uh that it's uh you know yeah so yeah. much so if you can get a hold of his books do because yeah i'll check if they're on amazon so um, what about uh, you, David? I know that, uh, um, that what we just touched on here, as awesome as it was, you know, you've got plenty more where that came from. So how can people find out more about you? Um, let, let me also say too, by the way, I, I need to put in a plug for uh, Brian Kurtz is coming out with a, I guess it's kind of a course based on Jim's, you know, writings and legacy. And okay. Everything. So Yeah. I met Brian I, in the US. He's really nice. He's very nice. He's very yeah. nice. So I, I would be remiss not to mention that he's. Yeah, I'd definitely that, be interested in that. Me, it'll either be out soon, or if you're watching this a couple of months from now, it you know it may already be out. So mm. so look for that. I have to check that out. What about you, David? How can people um, get on your uh, information? Um, people can go to uh, 
David L. Deutsch, uh, dot com. Uh, that's D A V I D and then L is in Larry and then D E U T S C H dot com. And um, there's a free report that you can get there and you can sign up on my list. And then I'll let you know, uh, in addition to getting regular emails from me of interesting things, I'll let you know when my new course comes out. Yeah, because that's the next question I was going to ask. You mentioned a course before. Yeah, yeah, it's being it's being put together right now. It's being edited. It's been, well, it's edited, but it's being assembled and gotten ready. So it should be should be set in about a month. And it looks like it will also include the creativity course that I'm okay. talking about. Yeah, will be, will be in there in some way nice. as a bonus or a part yeah. of it. Or so it's just like a copywriting course. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Definitely. Uh, yeah, anyone who's listening to this should definitely be uh, getting on that list because uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, secret weapons I've used over the years is to get on uh, certain people's email lists. And uh, you know, Brian Kurtz, who you mentioned, is one. Dan Kennedy, mm-hmm. obviously, and John Carlton and guys we've mentioned like that to um, get their emails and read their emails um, uh, because they're not just great. Uh, uh, examples of what good copywriting is but you know you get uh um uh you get first first dibs on on things like this new course and that, that's coming mm-hmm. out of yours david so um i highly recommend uh, if you got uh as much out of this interview as what i did then go and sign up for that that list right now so um i'll drop a link uh, on this uh, on youtube and on my site and on the okay. uh, if you're listening on itunes it's the david l deutsch d-e-u T S C H. Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so definitely uh, do that and um, and sign up, and uh, I'll be there right there with you. So yeah, I appreciate you coming along, uh, David. I, I thank you very much. Like I said, geniuses of copywriting uh, wouldn't be the name wouldn't be accurate if if you were on here. So um, uh, I really appreciate the time that you've uh, spent with us today. Um, and the, uh, the, the help that you've given us on, on our project. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much. And we'll have to do this again sometime. No, that would be great. No, thank you for inviting me. I yeah. enjoyed talking with you. An absolute pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you for listening to Geniuses of Copywriting with Brian Casagina. To get the full transcript and all the resources mentioned on today's show, go to www.geniusesofcopywriting.com now.